Hi everybody, a very good morning. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning for uh, a session on life after baby. So we're going to be talking a lot about, uh, you know, your newborn and how to take care of your child and all the questions that you have. We will be starting in just a couple of minutes. Um, so just wanted to say hello uh, and I'll introduce myself then as well. But uh, this is about an hour and a little more time. So it would be great if you can make yourself comfortable. Grab your bottle of water. If you haven't eaten anything, grab a snack. And uh, if your husband's available, just make sure that he's also a part of the session so that, you know, he can uh, uh, also get the information. And then post delivery, it would be a great support system uh, for you at home too. All right. So just a couple of minutes, we are all on time, we'll be getting started really soon. So just make sure you have everything organized and um, you're ready to make notes and uh, learn a lot about life after baby. All right, so everybody, I'm sure you're all set and we are ready to get started. Uh, so this is a webinar especially for our expecting moms and dads to help you prepare for life after baby. The session has been brought to you by Cod Life, which is India's leading stem cell bank and uh, in association with the Agarwal Nursing Home. So we're very thankful to Dr. Meera Agarwal for giving us this opportunity to speak to all of you this Sunday morning. So thank you very much for joining in. Uh, let's just get a few things uh, in place. Um, we have kept all of you on mute and uh, so that you know it doesn't disturb the session and I can cover all the information with you. However, if you actually look at uh, you know your dashboard, there is a questions section. So during the session also, if you have any questions, please keep posting them there. I will make sure that I answer all the questions before the end of the session. So that should motivate you to stay all the way till the very end. Uh, the other thing that I would also like to share is that uh, the recording of this session will be shared with all the participants by Cod Life on, in the next few days. So um, again, it's a good thing that you stay till the end of the session. Uh, at the end, we also have a little gift for you. So you will get the details of the gift coupon in the end. So again, that's the third motivation for staying till the end of the session. All right. So uh, let's get started. We are talking today about life after baby. This is the third session in our series, especially conducted for Dr. Meera Agarwal, uh, where the first two sessions talked about uh, pregnancy, talked about labor preparation. And for those of you who attended both those, um, thank you. And thank you for joining us again uh, this third time. All right. So let's get begun. So let me start with a very quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Sonali, Sonali Shivlani. I'm a pregnancy and postnatal consultant. I have been working in the field of babies and pregnancy and post delivery, uh, including child nutrition, um, etc. since the last 16 years. I started classes in 2004. On the personal front, I also have two small small, no, I can't say small. I, can't, I think of them as small, but I have two kids as well, although they're adults now. And um, yeah, life is being good. Uh, so I'm a storyteller and I'm going to tell you a lot of things in the form of personal experiences and client experiences as we go through the session about life after baby. Uh, what can you expect? We are talking about breastfeeding today. We're talking about your newborn. And we're also going to be talking about your mood changes and how you should adapt to the new life that you're going to bring into the world because it's definitely going to change your life completely. So the first thing on my discussion is obviously breastfeeding and breastfeeding is something which is very close to my heart. It's a very dear topic uh, because not only does breast milk impact the immediate health of the baby, but it also impacts the long-term health of the child plus the long-term health of the mother. 
So, you know, when mothers talk to me about labor and they kind of, you know, say that, oh, uh, uh, I need to prepare for labor and etc. I kind of go like, you know, labor is a few short hours and the doctor is going to be there. The, the medical staff is going to be there. They will help you some way or the other that baby is going to come out. But as far as breastfeeding is concerned, you have to do it on your own for many, many months. And it has such a long-term impact. So why not we focus on this? So it's a favorite topic and that's what we're going to start with. So is breast milk the right choice? Um, if you can see the picture, I made a picture of a golden colored liquid. And that's exactly what we call breast milk. It's called the golden liquid for your baby. So yes, yes and yes. Definitely breast milk is the right choice for you and your baby. I won't really dwell into the 101 advantages of breastfeeding if you're getting scared that, oh my God, we're going to listen to all of this. But I definitely want to share a few. Breast milk is, is the right composition nutritionally for your baby. It helps to prevent allergies. It helps to build immunity. And it also helps to build your baby's IQ. So that's like a lot of benefit as far as breast milk is concerned, right? But it's not only about the baby. I think the best advantage that I can suggest for the mother is that it helps you to lose weight. I'm a mom myself and it's like a big deal to lose all that extra pregnancy weight that we may have gained. So breastfeeding actually burns calories and it also helps to shrink your uterus. So lesser weight and faster um, uh, flat stomach is the big advantage that breastfeeding gives you. It is also super convenient. It's available at the right time, the right place, the right quantity, the right temperature. No other food in the world comes to that, right? And most importantly, it gives you protection against the various hormonal cancers. So breast cancer, uterine cancer, all of these you get a degree of protection. So it's definitely worth it to give breastfeeding a shot. These are some things which will help you. It's very important that you get breastfeeding started as soon as possible after birth. Your baby is going to be very, very alert and very, very active in the first couple of hours post delivery. So whether it's a vaginal birth or a cesarean section, the first thing that you should do when you're able to is latch the baby on. At this point, the baby is in a high learning stage and would want to learn breastfeeding really, really quickly. So that's something which can really help. Also, it helps to calm the baby down because when the baby hears your heartbeat, feels your warmth, gets your smell, kind of feels that, okay, things are normal. I don't need to be scared. I don't need to be worried. And the baby's heart rate and body temperature also get regulated. So it's a huge advantage as far as, uh, you know, the baby's development is concerned. The other thing that you have to focus on is making sure that the baby latches on really well. Now, when I'm looking at the way the breast is made, what you have is, let me show you this from inside. What you have is all these milk producing uh, cells, and then you have all these little pipes which are carrying the milk to the areola. They're not being carried to the nipple, they're being carried to the areola, right? So keeping that in perspective, if your baby latches on only to the nipple, the baby is not really going to get any milk, which is what is going to cause discomfort, pain, because the baby will start nibbling, biting, chewing, and all of those things. However, if the baby opens the mouth wide and latches on to the areola, the baby will get the milk, the milk will come out from the nipple, and the baby will be definitely happy. So therefore, working on the latch, right from the very beginning is extremely important. Now, when we're saying that the baby's mouth has to be wide open, one more thing that you should keep in mind is that the lips are also flanged open because what the baby is doing inside is actually lapping the breast, right? The baby is not doing this. What the baby is actually doing is this. So this is possible only if the lips are flanged open. Now, how can you do that? What you can do is you could probably tug at the chin, you could tug at the nose, 
you could compress the breast a little and push more of the breast in the mouth. So making sure that the latch is absolutely perfect. If you're feeling any pain, then stop and correct yourself. The third thing is your comfort. If you are feeling uncomfortable, then breastfeeding is definitely not going to last for a long time. So take as many pillows as you need. Make sure your shoulders, back, arms, legs, everything is well supported. Don't hunch over, bend over, lean over. Always bring the baby to you. Right? Don't kind of, you know, make yourself uncomfortable because your body is less mobile than the baby is mobile. So bring the baby close to you while feeding. It's important that you feed often because the more you feed, the more milk you are going to make. Now, the last thing that I would really like you to be aware of is the baby's stomach size. And to make this really interesting, I'm going to show you what your baby's stomach looks like when the baby is born. That's it. That's the baby's stomach size when your baby is born. It's that tiny, which means that the baby really, really does not need too much milk. And that is why also nature has designed it that milk production in the beginning is really, really low. However, the baby grows really fast. And by the time your baby is about three to five days old, that's what the stomach is going to look like. Which means that if the mother has been feeding often and the supply has been developed, the baby's stomach would definitely have caught up. And the milk supply would be equivalent to what the baby requires. By the time your baby is about 7 to 10 days old, that's the size of the stomach. So the baby's stomach grows really rapidly over the first few days. And it's really important that the first few days are spent by the mother in a lot of focus, making sure that there is adequate stimulation and feeding for the baby. These are three golden rules that I want you to remember. Even if you don't remember anything else from this session, please make a note of this. The more you feed, the more milk you make. So in the beginning, it helps to set your milk supply. And in the long run, it helps to maintain your milk supply. You need to drink plenty of fluids. Having about 12 to 14 glasses of water every day is really essential. Breast milk is liquid, isn't it? So if you're going to have adequate liquid, you're going to make adequate breast milk. And the third is smile. Now that's the easiest. The simple logic is the less stressed you are, the more oxytocin you will be able to produce, which means there will be more milk production. So if you're going to get stressed out, if you're going to get anxious, if you're going to be worried and you're going to be all negative, then you're going to produce less milk. So make sure you smile, surround yourself with positive people, think positively. And if there's anybody who's making you feel negative, just put them away from your life, at least in this period. These are some common concerns that mothers might experience while breastfeeding. The first is engorgement. The breast can feel really heavy, can feel really hard by the third or the fourth day when the milk actually starts coming. It's a good idea that you wear a bra, which will help to support the breast. Use cotton. Don't use underwires. And you can soak your breasts in warm water, take a warm shower, gently massage the breast, express a little milk, so that will help the baby to latch on a lot more easier. Leaking is very, very common as far as breastfeeding is concerned. So when I'm feeding on the left side, the right side would drip. When I'm feeding on the right side, the left side would drip. Um, this is normal. When we are feeding, this is something which happens. This is something which is really, really common. What you can use is breast pads, which is going to help to keep you feeling comfortable, uh, not getting damp and not getting embarrassed, of course. But you have to remember that you should change the breast pads really often. right? Don't sit around with a damp uh, breast pad because this can help to then start breeding infection. So take care of this. It's an essential part of the breastfeeding equation. Uh, whenever you start feeding the baby, it is normal to feel cramps in the abdomen. Remember I told you your uterus is going to start shrinking. So that is what's happening. Every time you feed, your uterus gets like a little cramp 
and that helps the uterus to shrink back to its original size and shape. So period like cramps when you start breastfeeding in the initial few weeks is really normal. If you have sore nipples, your latch is definitely not right. So stop, pause, correct the latch and then move ahead. Sore nipples will result in pain. Pain is going to make, make you know, get you to crack nipples. Crack nipples will bleed and eventually you stop breastfeeding. So if you start right in the very beginning with the right latch, you will not have pain or sore nipples. I showed you the internal working of the breast. There are all those really tiny ducts. And that is what causes the tingling sensation. It can feel like little ants running down your breast, which is really normal. Lumps do happen. But when lumps stay for a long time, it can result in a breast infection. And that's something that we don't want. So every morning when you're taking a shower, I would recommend that you do a breast massage. You do a breast massage. You don't have any outside person doing the breast massage. So what you're going to do is circular movements like this all over the body of the breast and then do downward strokes towards the nipple, right? And it has to be really gentle. We don't want any outside person massaging the breast because that is going to A, be really rough and that can cause damage to your ducts and B, it can also lead to infection because where milk is coming out, that means the pores are open infection can go inside. So take good care of yourself and ensure that you do your breast massage yourself. And if you see any lumps, make sure you let your doctor know immediately. Breast milk can be expressed and stored as well. So if you are going to be stepping away and you need to be feeding the baby, you don't need to rely on formula. So breast milk can be kept at room temperature for four hours. It can be refrigerated for 48 hours. It can be kept in the deep freezer for about three months. And if you're lucky and you have a special freezer only for breast milk, then it can be also kept for six months. Many parents ask me this question, really? Is it safe? Because, you know, we, we are in a country which kind of believes that cook now and eat now. So how are we going to give like frozen milk to the baby? That can be a question mark, right? But the answer is yes, it is absolutely safe for the baby. Okay? There are various ways that you can express breast milk. You could express it manually and you could also express it uh, using a manual breast pump. You could express using an electronic breast pump. And let's talk a little bit about each of these. When you're manually expressing, a lot of women will kind of go like this. You know, they will grab a hold of the nipple and they will try to collect the milk this way. This is the wrong way of expressing manually because in this way, you're going to get nothing, right? The best way to express manually, and trust me, you will get a lot of milk that way, uh, is the correct way, which I'm going to show you now. So take your thumb and forefinger, place it on the outside of the areola and comp, you know, just Push it back against the chest wall and compress, right? So let me tell you again. Take your thumb and forefinger, place it on the outside of the areola like this and push it against the chest wall and then kind of compress and push and compress, push and compress. That's going to get you good spots of milk. And then when you feel that, okay, these ducts seem to be done, you can kind of shift it a little bit and do the same thing in a different area. This way, you're going to get a lot more milk and you can do it manually too. So if you're the mom who suddenly has to step out, doesn't have a breast pump, uh, it's going to be a once in a while situation, you might want to do this. Having a breast pump can be helpful, but a manual breast pump means that you have to constantly do this. You have to, you'll be using your hand all the time that you want to express the milk, which is fine. They are inexpensive and um, they also don't have any mechanisms or motors. So the, uh, the chances of getting spoiled or etc. are much lower. So if you want to express occasionally, but you just want the convenience of not having to press your breast yourself, then a manual breast pump may be a good investment for you. Then you have the electronic single breast pump. 
Uh, this is great for mothers who are planning to return to work when their baby is a few months old. Or if, you know, maybe the baby is in the NICU for a few days, uh, you need to kind of start stimulating, expressing milk. Uh, an electronic breast pump is super convenient. You just place it on, press the buttons, and the pump does the job. You can just sit back and relax and read a book, watch TV, and all of those things as well. So your, your hand is not working. That becomes a benefit. So that's something that you could consider. They're a bit expensive, but uh, they give you the convenience. And of course, there is a possibility of maintenance because there is a motor. And then you also have a double electronic breast pump. So if you have to return to work really early when the baby is very young, or if you plan to kind of, you know, be, oh, in case you have a baby who's in the NICU for an extended period of time, then this is also something that you could consider uh, using. Now that I'm done with talking about breastfeeding, these are some of the things that you are going to need for your newborn, right? So um, you have to decide on where the baby is going to be sleeping. There is the question of co-sleeping. There is also the question of uh, whether the baby is going to have a bed next to your bed or is the baby going to be in another room altogether. So the choice is completely yours as to what you feel comfortable. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as all the pediatrics associations across the world, recommend that baby should have a separate safe sleeping space because that ensures that there is no chance of the, your covers, your body, your hand going onto the baby and causing a suffocation problem. Um, on the emotional front or the psychological front, what we've also seen is that when we have the baby co-sleeping with the parents, they kind of get used to that. And then weaning them from your bed to their own bed can actually become a challenge. And um, I mean, you really want your life as well, right? I mean, you don't want to have a baby sleeping between the two of you forever. You might want to think of nappies, diapers, clothes, swaddle cloths, caps, mittens, and socks. That's what we call your baby's layout. And these are the things your baby will require in the initial few days. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about all of these as we move along. Then there's the bathing equipment, what you're going to need to bathe your baby. What are you going to need to massage your baby? Uh, you might need some hygiene items like soap, shampoos, nail cutters. And then there are obviously special items like the carry cot, pram, baby wraps, baby carriers. All of those things can become important aspects. Before we get into uh, explaining each of those, because that's your shopping list, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the common concerns that your baby might have. And uh, I'm going to show you pictures for each of these so that it's easy to understand. Most babies are born with a head which looks like this. It's nice and extended and shaped and it's pretty normal. Uh, when, you, when your baby learns how to roll over, it's going to get the advantage of gravity then in the reverse direction, which is going to help the head to shape up on its own. But many times, you know, parents have uh, experience that the baby has a flat head. The baby kind of seems to have a conical head for a while. So what you should ideally do is right from the beginning, you can, um, you know, give the baby some tummy time, but supervised, always be present. Don't try to pat and tap and massage the baby's head. That's not really going to help. But you can kind of, you know, place your baby in different directions. Generally, babies turn towards where the mother is sleeping. So they get used to sleeping, facing in one direction, and then that can result in a flat head on one side. So, you know, of course, it might be very difficult to change your sleeping angle, but you might want to change the baby's sleeping angle. So if the baby is sleeping with his head in one direction on a particular day, on another day, change the direction to another side, which will encourage the baby to turn his head on his own. Most babies are born with a lot of body hair. And this is called birth hair and it's going to fall off. So all the body hair is going to generally shed off on its own. So we don't need hook turns and massages and etc. to get these out. So don't worry about it at all. Right? As far as the head, head hair is concerned, some babies are born with a full head of hair. And it's very normal for us to see some amount of hair fall in the third, fourth, fifth month after the baby is born. So that's really normal. Also, hair is scanty. It looks really thin. 
So uh, don't worry, the hair is going to become thicker and a more fuller hair by the time your baby is about a year, year and a half old, naturally. So doing the mundans, etc. is not something that we would, uh, you know, really recommend to get thicker, more bountiful hair. It doesn't work that way. Most babies are also born a little cockeyed. They kind of look as if their eye muscles are looking in one direction and the other direction. They're not looking in the same direction. And this is completely normal. So don't worry about it. Just be completely relaxed about it. The eye muscles are not fully developed. And um, it's going to take a while, uh, a few weeks post-delivery for your baby's eye muscles to look completely coordinated. A little amount of vaginal bleeding on your baby girl's nappy or diaper is very common. This is your baby's first period. And it can freak you out when you see a diaper which looks like this, isn't it? But don't worry. This is completely normal and it is just the maternal hormones which have transferred from the placenta to the baby. And they will subside and the next period will make its appearance only when your baby girl hits puberty. The umbilical cord is cut for you at birth and they're going to put a little plastic clip there. It looks pretty ugly, isn't it? But this is normal. It uh, has no nerves over there so it's not going to hurt your baby. The only thing that you have to be careful of is that don't cover it with a diaper or a nappy because then there is a chance that urine or fecus could touch it and then that can cause an infection. So always keep the nappy or diaper folded below the navel. The stump is going to fall off anywhere on its own between 7 to 10 days and at that time you might see a little amount of bleeding from the umbilicus which is normal. So till then there should be no pus, there should be no drainage, nothing coming from the umbilical area. After the cord has fallen off, the stump might look a little elevated, which is normal. You don't need to press it or tie it. There are navel binders available in the market and we do not recommend those. Babies are going to cry, which is normal. So, of course, they cry because they are hungry. They will cry because they are, uh, you know, maybe they have a dirty diaper. They would cry because, uh, you know, they, they just need attention. And sometimes babies also cry if they have colic. So colic is considered to be intestinal pains or cramps in the intestine. The baby's intestines are still not fully developed. And when they first start using the digestive system for the first few weeks, they might get these colic pains. We really can't do anything about it. And all of us still are guessing as to what exactly is colic and what helps to solve it. So keep this in mind. You just need your patience. You can speak to your pediatrician though. And if you find that, you know, your baby is getting these gas pains at the same time every day, then it's classified as colic. And the doctor will recommend some medications which you can give. These medications are absolutely safe for your baby. Please don't self-medicate at home. Some brands of bright water, etc. also have, um, you know, let's call it uh, alcohol in it. And it might not be suitable and favorable for your child. So whatever you give to your baby, it should always be prescribed by your doctor. Now let's talk a little bit about baby massage. I'm sure that's a question that all of you are burning to ask because everybody is talking about it. And when you deliver, the pediatrician will immediately say, no oil massage for the baby. And that's something which, you know, the mother-in-laws or the mothers in the house will say, Oh, but all of us have already done it. What does the doctor know? We are going to do it. And then that makes the poor parents completely stuck. Right? So the doctor is saying don't do it. Mother-in-law is saying do it. What does the mother do? What does the father do? Right? So let's come up with an in-between solution to understand what massage is all about. The first thing is no massage till the cord has healed. Because you can cause an infection. So till the stump has healed completely, so it can take about 15 days till after the cord has fallen off, it can take 4-5 days for the stump to heal. No massage till that point of time. The second one is really important. Massage is mainly for bonding. It's for touch therapy. So only parents should do the massage. Right? No outside person because of infection, rough handling, there could be a lot of issues. So only parents should do the massage. The touch has to be super gentle. You are massaging a little flower. How can you, you know, 
do things like that, you know, pulling and tugging and all of that, that's something which is not recommended. What I would suggest is take your two fingers, place them on your eyes if you're not wearing contact lenses, of course, so place them on your eyes and massage your eyes, right? The kind of pressure that you're using to massage your eyes is the kind of pressure that you have to use to massage the baby, right? Avoid using any products, especially on the face, because the face is highly prone to allergies. So it's a good idea to not put oils, lotions, creams, all of those, body wash, everything onto the baby's face. It's not worth it. Always do a patch test. So whatever product you're planning to use, do a patch test, which you can do on the back of the leg, uh, just behind the knee, uh, in a small area, leave it for half an hour, and then again repeat it the next day. Um, if there is no reaction in 48 hours, it should be safe to use on the baby's body. Um, always do the massage when the baby is in the right mood. I mean, imagine if somebody comes to you at 3 o'clock in the morning and says, hey, come on, get up, I'm going to give you a massage. What are you going to feel, right? What are you going to feel like, boom, I don't know, you get lost, right? That's what happens with the baby. Poor baby is fast asleep. And just because we have a schedule that we want to follow, it kind of suits us. We do the massage at a time when the baby is not ready, not receptive. So the baby doesn't really enjoy the massage. Okay? So I'm going to show you a little video with a few massage strokes. And um, I'll try to explain it along the way as well. So the video might lag a little because I'm going to stop it while I'm explaining it. Uh, so don't worry about it, okay? So it's going to be a very, very, it's a short video, but because of the explanation, I will pause the video at various points. So first, always seek permission from the baby. Ask the baby, are you ready for a massage? Is this something that you want? Are you looking for it? So, you know, place your hand on the baby's body. Uh, gently undress the baby, kind of make the baby receptive to the massage. Then you can start doing these kind of strokes, which are using your entire hand all over the body of the baby, right? So for large body parts, we use our hand in this fashion. You can also use fanning movements like this. For large body parts and then you can use actions this way again for the arms and the legs which are considered to be large body parts but as you can see what I'm doing is really gentle strokes when I'm using my fingers for the smaller body parts the same movements fanning movements even when I'm doing the face without any oil or lotion, I'm going to use my fingers so that the massage is really gentle. Now I'm going to show you how to turn the baby around because for most new parents, this is the general question mark. How do I turn the baby around? It's really scary, right? So let's take a look at it. What I've done is, as you can see, I've placed one hand in the front on both sides of the baby's nose and I'm going to place the other hand behind Support the baby, turn the baby over, and help the head to turn. And then I can do the same actions on the back of the baby's body. Right? So the baby really enjoys this. Now I'm going to turn the baby over, same movements, support the head, and flip. All right? Now, what I'm showing you is concentric circles around the navel. This is a great massage for colic. Then you do the I, L, and U stroke. So this is called I love you. That's called the I love you stroke. You can press the baby's legs gently into the lower abdomen also to help relieve colic. Do some exercises, but only do them just as for the range of movement of the baby. You can also try to do hand and toe touches. Right? So that's a few things that you can do uh, on your own. And you don't need to worry about 
about uh, you know whether your baby is enjoying it or not. You can see if the baby is enjoying it, you continue. If the baby is not enjoying it, you don't continue. Okay. The next thing, obviously, after the massage is generally a bath. So we also recommend starting the bath once the stump has fallen off and healed. Till then, you can do a sponge bath. Now, since we are going to be doing the massage ourselves, we might want to do the bath ourselves as well. So you can invest in a nice bath chair so that it's really convenient for you to handle the baby and you're not super scared. Uh, soap also needs to be avoided on the face. Just wash the face with water. When you're testing the water temperature, it has to be tepid to your elbow. So always insert your elbow into the bucket of water, test the temperature and then use it all over the body of the baby. It's very important that when you're bathing the baby, never leave the baby alone in the bath area. Because there can be, even you know, in a little bit of water also, there could be a drowning hazard and we don't want to take that chance. When we're looking at diapering and dressing your baby, you have choices between nappies or diapers. There's a lot of things out there which says that nappies are better because they are cloth, um, but many parents prefer diapers because they're convenient and disposable. Either option is great. It's not that nappies are better or diapers are better in terms of the diaper rash. Diaper rash happens only when you leave the urine and fecus in contact with the baby's skin for a long period of time. So whatever you use, be alert and change the baby often. Cotton clothes is what is recommended for the baby because it helps the baby's skin to breathe and it's generally not causing any allergies. Swaddling is something that babies enjoy because it helps to replicate the womb environment. But do leave the baby open as well because that will allow the baby to move around and will help in bone and muscle development. When you do swaddle the baby, Please do not swaddle very tightly. Swaddle very lightly because in the womb also your baby was able to move, right? So it's very important that you do not swaddle the baby very, very tightly. Do not overdress babies. I think we have this real bad habit, right? We'll put on clothes, we'll put on vests, we'll put on sweaters, we'll have socks, mittens, caps. And then we kind of also swaddle and then we have a carrier. So babies are like, you know, a big cocoon and that's not required. Overheating can also increase the risk of sins. So always dress the baby in the same amount of clothing that you're wearing, but maybe add an extra layer because, you know, they're still tiny, so they might not be able to regulate their body temperature as well as you can. Now let's talk a little bit about the mother, right? There are a lot of changes that happen in the mother post delivery, and this is in terms of mood swings. Many of you during pregnancy may have realized that you're a little bit more irritable, a little bit more cranky, a little bit more, you know, you get upset at small things. This is all because of your pregnancy hormones. But post delivery also, while these hormones settle down, you might experience these issues. So baby blues are generally common in the birth to two weeks phase. If it's lasting longer than two weeks, you could have what is called postpartum depression. And just because I'm using these words doesn't mean that you're going nuts and mad and you need a psychiatrist, but you definitely should consider seeking help. Baby blues will give you mild up and downs, a little bit of weepiness, a little bit of stress and anxiety. But when you have depression, the symptoms are a little bit more severe and appears irrational. I mean, you know, if the mother is just uh, overly paranoid, overly possessive about the baby, overly, you know, upset about things, then those are severe symptoms which are bordering to irrationality. Baby blues generally do not need any medical help and they would pretty much settle on their own. But postpartum depression will need some special counseling. And here I would seriously recommend psychologist and uh, before you get to a psychiatrist. Psychiatrists will generally prescribe medication, which may be detrimental to breastfeeding. So we'll start with a little bit of counseling before we even get to that space. Most mothers just need a little bit of talking, a little bit of ranting, and then they're okay. And it's just fine. So um, keep this alert. That's why I wanted fathers to be present. Because sometimes mothers may not realize that they're going through certain things. Right? In baby blues, getting a lot of rest, good family support. And, you know, an overall atmosphere of positivity, any which ways I want positivity for breastfeeding, right, will help to settle it down. 
you definitely need all of these things in postpartum depression as well. But having a few sessions with a therapist who understands the condition would be really helpful. Moms are going to go through some of these physical changes. You're going to be sleep deprived. Definitely. 110%. So this is completely normal. Babies have a really tiny stomach. I just showed that to you. So they need to eat every 2-3 hours. Which means that they're going to get up often at night. Also, babies have a reverse sleep clock. They're not like, you know, sleeping with like us at night and staying awake during the day. Many babies in the womb would sleep a lot during the day and you would find that they were really active at night. So they're following that same cycle even now once they're born. And that is something which is going to take a while to settle. So it's natural that you're going to have less sleep. You're not going to have those you know, coveted seven to eight hours of continuous sleep for the next few weeks, maybe months also. This is going to make you feel exhausted because you are kind of, you know, taking care of a baby, diapering, feeding, crying, all of those things, you know, and you're totally, just a thought that you're totally responsible for this human being. And oh my God, if you're not there, then what's going to happen can be very mentally exhausting. Hormonal changes make you feel irritable, which is very normal. You might feel that you're lost, a little overwhelmed, especially if you don't have support because, you know, you have to take care of the baby and you don't know what in heaven's name is happening. Many mothers will also experience body image issues because you kind of were used to fitting into certain jeans, some, some types of clothes, and then now suddenly, you know, you have this big stomach, these heavy breasts, and... It's kind of not very attractive looking to you. Because of the hormonal changes, there's a lot of vaginal dryness. Um, there is exhaustion and, you know, sleep deprivation. So you're definitely going to experience lack of sexual interest. And, you know, if your partner is uh, kind of, you know, giving you some overtures and all, that might also make you feel a little overwhelmed that why are you not feeling responsive the way you were earlier? But be prepared. This is really normal. I mean, who is going to have sexual interest when there's a natural contraceptive living in the room with you, isn't it? Here are some very quick tips to ease the transition to parenthood. Read, read, and read. So read as much as you can, but please make sure you read authentic information. Getting onto Google and reading every conceivable website can really scare you. So look for authentic information and read questions right ask questions from your doctors other you know mothers family members but please make your own decisions sometimes mothers groups can also be very overwhelming talk and discuss your feelings and expectations don't expect even your husband to understand what you're feeling or what you need i mean if you want a break right you want that half an hour to just take a bath at your own pace ask him tell him tell him i really need to take a bath can you please handle the baby for half an hour so that I'm not disturbed? That's good, right? Talk about it. Plan for some help. Don't aim at doing everything yourself. I mean, yes, you're a superwoman. I completely vouch for that. But you don't need to act like superwoman. So always get some help. Uh, and that's something which is very helpful in the immediate postpartum period. Plan a little bit in advance and prepare for emergencies. So, you know, do your baby shopping in advance, keep things ready. Don't, don't overbuy, of course, but the basics. Keep things ready and plan this in advance so that you don't panic. Oh my God, I don't have this. Oh my God, what do I do? So, these are things that you should be prepared for. Don't blame yourself or your spouse if all does not go as per plan. So, you know, you might have this grand plan to do grand things, but things may not happen that way. After all, we're dealing with a human being. And things can change. Things can be different. So it's perfectly okay for things to go a little up and down. And it's completely normal. Right? It's also important that you set aside some me time for yourself. So do things that you enjoy. Whether it's read a book, watch TV serial. Uh, I can't even say go for a massage now because the spas are closed. But, you know, maybe just treat yourself. Do a nice manicure by yourself at home. Sometimes, you know, uh, just wearing a nice bright colored lipstick can make you feel nice and bright. 
So set aside some time to pamper yourself. That's what I'm trying to get at. Also set aside time for yourself as a couple because there were so many things that you used to talk about and enjoy doing together uh, before the arrival of the baby. But after the arrival of the baby, the only thing that's happening is baby poop is this color, baby pee is this many times, baby cried, baby did not sleep. You know, you're kind of all over the place on that. So it's really important that you kind of, you know, uh, spend some time doing things that you used to do, talking about things that you used to talk about, and just taking a little time, even if it's 15, 20 minutes every day, away from the baby topic, right? You may be holding your baby, that's fine, but away from the baby topic. Um, so I'm going to now obviously get to the questions, uh, but before that, let me tell you about the coupon that you have, right? So uh, in the next two or three days, the Cod Life team is going to get in touch with you and is going to share this coupon with you. It's a coupon from Mama Earth, which is a, a maternity and baby product, completely natural, organic ingredients. And the uh, basic fundamental is that you can use this gift voucher to buy some of this stuff to pamper yourself or your baby, whatever you prefer, right? They will also ask you uh, if you'd like to take a presentation to hear about the stem cell banking concept. So uh, make sure that you take the call because uh, then they can also share the coupon and the recording of the session with you. Um, I'm open to questions, but as I said, uh, this is my website, which is baby360degrees.com. I would really request that, uh, you know, follow me on Instagram and Facebook. My handle is at baby360degrees because I do a lot of fun stuff there uh, in terms of polls, giveaways, contests, and information, of course. I also have a YouTube channel, which is The Pregnancy Coach by Baby360Degrees. Some of you are also on our tip of the day service uh, through this group that has been created for the Mira Garwal Clinic. But of course, because today's the last session, that group is going to end. But you could sign up for the tip of the day service by sending us a WhatsApp on this number. And it's a free service. So um, let us know if you'd like to get in. Send a WhatsApp to this number. It's 8108-360-360. And um, all you need to do is send your name and your expected due date to this number and we will get you added. If you have any friends who are pregnant who would like to be added to this service, then please send their name and phone number and due date as well. Right? So um, now opening the floor to questions. All right, so the first question is, when shall we start applying baby body wash immediately after birth? Uh, well, so I think I've answered this question uh, during the session that we're going to wait for the stump to fall off and then we'll do a patch test. So whichever product that you plan to use, uh, that's something that you can um, try. Okay. Sometimes nipples become hard and difficult to feed immediately after birth. Is it okay to massage Vaseline or ghee just a few days before the delivery? Yes, you can. You can massage the Vaseline and the ghee, but start this only a few days before delivery because nipple stimulation sometimes can result in uh, preterm contractions. So we don't want that to happen. Okay. Uh, by when does milk production start? Um, the milk production will generally start about 48 to 72 hours before, after you deliver. Till then, what you're making is colostrum, which is very little, just a couple of drops at any given point of time. And the second part of this question is, what if you have started leaking colostrum in the eighth month? Is it safe? Yes, it is. Uh, many mothers will find that they have uh, breast discharge. So if it's a little bit and, uh, you know, it's happening uh, in the third trimester, it's considered to be completely normal. Um, the hospital bag, what you need to carry, the first thing is you should check with your hospital what they would provide for you and for the baby. Uh, but typically what you need to carry is all your clothes and toiletries and whatever you would require for the baby. 
So whether it's clothes, diapers, bottle cloths, and etc. So carry all of these things, uh, depending on what your hospital would prefer. Uh, you might want to carry your slippers and etc. Um, also for the labor and delivery, you might want to have a, a few comfort tools, some massage tools, uh, you know, maybe your uh, your favorite pillow, your your bed sheet, something which makes you feel comfortable, and um, you know, all of these things would help you. Uh, we also generally recommend to carry, uh, you know, a few light snacks, uh, your partner's toothbrush, etc., because sometimes labor can be really long. So that could be helpful too. Uh, what about baby massages by Japas? I'm afraid I might not do it the correct way. So we, we are not recommending a massage by any outside person. Uh, various reasons. They are very rough. They can cause infections. Massages for bonding. You don't really want the baby to bond with the Japa. Uh, in this current scenario also, as far as the COVID situation is concerned, the less handling by outsiders of the baby, the better. And there is nothing that says that you would do it wrong if you do it gently. As long as the baby is enjoying, as long as the baby is having fun, you can definitely go ahead and do the massage. Uh, yes, most hospitals prefer that you carry all baby toiletries to the hospital as well. Uh, the World Health Organization recommends that you should uh, feed the baby exclusively for six months. That means nothing but mother's milk. And then after that, uh, you would uh, introduce some solids, and uh, but breast milk will continue. So the recommendation is still at least one year of age. The second year would become the baby's choice uh, and the mother's choice. Um, is it safe to wear padded nursing bra during the first few days of feeding? Yes, it is. But again, as I said, if you're leaking and the bra becomes damp, you have to change it immediately. If you sit around with a damp bra, then that is going to cause infections. I am in the 22nd week. Can the body get addicted to doxinate? Uh, all right, so doxinate is something which is given for anti-vomiting. And no, the body does not get addicted to it. Uh, the nausea is happening because of hormonal changes. So when you stop taking the doxinate, the hormones still haven't settled down. And therefore, the nausea comes back. It's not because of being addicted to doxinate per se. Okay. Um, and you can take it for the entire duration of pregnancy. Some mothers, unfortunately, may have nausea for the entire pregnancy. Uh, and doxinate is literally, um, you know, uh, just to curb the symptoms so that you can at least eat something. That's the fundamental. Uh, which is the best position to hold the baby while breastfeeding and how do you know the baby is done? Um, the best position is the position that you and the baby are comfortable in. The books have various positions like cradle, cross cradle, football, etc. But if you're comfortable feeding, hanging upside down, I'm fine with it. Right? So whatever is comfortable for you and the baby. And uh, the best way to judge is not per feed but over 24 hours. If you find that the baby is urinating a minimum of seven times in 24 hours, then you know that the breast milk was sufficient. Uh, what can we use for dry skin and itching? Uh, you can use any moisturizer which has vitamin E, but if the itching is persistent, then you should bring it to the attention of your doctor because it could be a liver function issue, a test would be recommended, and medications depending on the results of the test. So don't ignore it if it is something which is really persistent. Uh, I have already explained uh, lumps and I've shown you how to do a breast massage during the session. So that's how you avoid it. If the ducts get clogged, it can form a lump. So a regular self breast massage every morning with warm water and soap when you're taking a shower will really help. Um, so uh, maternity sanitary pads are available at the chemist. A lot of mothers today are preferring to use um, diapers, adult diapers, because they can just dispose of the entire thing uh, easily. And uh, that's an option that you could consider as well. After a few days, once your vaginal stitches have healed, then you can also use the regular sanitary pads because the flow would have also reduced.
what kind of special diet needs to be maintained by mothers right after birth? Uh, mothers have to eat regular food, uh, whatever is being made at home, a healthy, balanced diet. So there are three words that I ask mothers to keep in mind. Eat healthy, eat balanced, and eat in moderation. There is no food which really needs to be avoided uh, as long as it's healthy. And uh, if it's healthy and you're eating uh, small portions of it, that's called moderation. And don't eat only one food just because it's healthy. So if you know, you know that apples are healthy, the only food you're eating is apple, that's not balancing. So you kind of, you know, uh, have all different food groups and that's something which uh, is required. Um, how often does the baby need to be breastfed? Uh, typically, babies will need to eat about 8 to 10 times in the first few uh, 15 to 20 days of life. After that, babies will settle into their own routine. Most babies will still eat about 8 to 10 times in the first 8 to 12 weeks. Now, but however, how it gets spaced out will depend on the baby's sleeping cycles. So if the baby is sleeping for long, taking a long nap at certain hours of the day, you need to finish the eight feeds in the rest of the day. So that's the only thing that you have to keep track of once the baby is about 15, 20 days old, that the baby is um, feeding about eight times a day for sure. And then you keep track of the urine, which should be a minimum of eight, uh, seven uh, wet nappies or diapers every day. All right, there is a lot of low BP issue. How should I cure it during pregnancy? Um, so, you know, there is uh, low BP if it's not causing you any problem, like uh, dizziness or blackout spells or feeling weak and low or giving you that sinking feeling, then it's considered to be okay. It's not something that we would be alarmed about. But one of the things which does help is that you make, make sure that you keep yourself well hydrated. So having a little bit of, you know, a small glass of Nimbu Bani with a little salt in it uh, every two, three hours can actually help to uh, maintain the levels. Uh, can fish, egg white, meat and red meat safe to consume after birth in the first month? Yes, it is. Uh, in the current season, if you are from Mumbai, since it's the rainy season, uh, fish is not recommended because we don't get fresh catch. Once uh, the rainy season is over, then fish is also uh, absolutely okay to eat during pregnancy and post-therapy. Do we have to worry about less baby movements from seventh month itself? Yes, you should. You should be doing a fetal kick count uh, every day and you should get about 10 movements on a daily basis. If the movements are reduced, uh, you should get uh, the doctor to check for you. Um, so, any other questions? Uh, we're almost at uh, an hour. And um, just a gentle reminder, you have all the details on the screen. So, you can make a note of those and stay in touch with us over social media as well. Um, immediately after birth, can we eat proper food or is it necessary to have just liquids? Um, if you have a cesarean section, my dear, yes, you would need to have liquids for the first uh, 24 hours or so. But um, after uh, that, you can eat normal food once the doctor gives you the go ahead. In a vaginal birth, you can eat a full meal as soon as you've delivered. It doesn't matter. It's perfectly okay. Um, we are looking at 10 movements uh, in a day, uh, but generally babies have these periods of movements. So you could consider trying to do a count of 10 movements in a particular span of time when the baby is most active. What kind of pillow and blanket is recommended for the baby after birth? Um, no pillows. It's not necessary. 
that even if you are looking at using a pillow, getting something which is, you know, uh, moldable, so the ones which are, um, which are made of mustard seeds and etc., uh, you could use that basically to support the neck. It's not to support the head, right? It's to support the neck. Uh, as far as the blanket is concerned, whatever you're using to cover the baby, it should not be kept loose, right? It should be all tucked in because blankets, covers, bed covers, they can go on the baby's face and that can cause a choking hazard. So always the, uh, the whatever cover you're using for the baby has to be uh, tucked in. So the best recommendation would be to use a sleep sack so that, that there's no way that that can go over uh, the baby's uh, face. If a pregnant woman contracts COVID, is there any complications? <laughs> well, so uh, the research that has come out as far as pregnancy and COVID is concerned is that COVID will cause the same complications as it would to any other person, but it does not cause, cause any harm to the developing fetus. So it also does not transfer to the baby through pregnancy, right? So it's not causing complications to the baby, but the mother will... Uh, depending on the severity of the symptoms, uh, will go through the, the the discomfort that COVID would cause. So it's a good idea to practice uh, special social distancing more than anything else. Yeah, so uh, especially for pregnancy, you know, kind of avoid meeting people, uh, do your social distancing, uh, avoid, uh, you know, going to crowded places. Even when you're going to your doctor's clinic, come home uh, and change uh, uh, often, like, you know, change your clothes. Uh, don't wait in the doctor's office for long hours. If you can wait in your car and then when it's your turn, you can just quickly go in, meet the doctor and come out so you're not waiting in the waiting room. So these are some things that you could, you could do. You can check with your doctor and you can take a vitamin C and zinc supplement on a daily basis. So add that to your supplemental intake as that builds immunity. Uh, which oil is best for mother's massage and belly massage? Um, anything, whatever suits you, whatever you like. Uh, you can go ahead and use it. Uh, just to add there, belly massage is not going to make your belly thinner. Right? So don't try to think that, you know, when I'm doing that massage, I'm going to get a flat belly. It doesn't work that way. If it would, I would be waiting in line for the massage as well. right? Uh, but only exercise will help. And of course, the natural contraction of the uterus. So that is something that you can uh, keep in mind. Um, so in a vaginal birth, you can start exercising about six to eight weeks, everything. You can start doing everything about six to eight weeks post delivery. In a cesarean section, we generally wait for three months. As long as you're doing a regular routine, not overdoing things, uh, breastfeeding and exercise have no connection. So I'm really happy that you guys are enjoying the session uh, and uh, we would love some feedback. So you can also put your feedback uh, here in the chat. And of course, you can always uh, give me a Google review feedback uh, to my website, which is baby360degrees.com. So look it up and, you know, write a little Google review there. That really helps, uh, helps us in uh, building awareness uh, for the services. Um, you can massage in any which ways you want, uh, but generally when you are starting the massage, it should be from up to down because uh, you'll start at the fundus, which is at the top of the uterus, and you kind of go gently in the downward strokes. This is the massage right in the very beginning, but a lot of times mothers continue the massage for a few months, and then it doesn't make a difference. Um, thank you, Mansi. That is really kind of you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on Instagram and Facebook and um, also the, the Google review if you have a moment to write it for us. All right, ladies and gentlemen and daddies, if any of you are also part of the session. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday morning. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be a part of this. and. Um, uh, all the very best to you. Have a safe pregnancy, a healthy birth, and a very healthy baby. I think that's the best wish that we have for all of you, that you should have a healthy and happy baby. Right? 
Thank you so much. Have a great day. Hope you enjoy your Sunday and take care.